true voices, everybody. Praise him. Praise him. Jesus. Wow. I see the glory of the Lord in the church, folks. I see it from left to right and right to left. I see it over the whole church. It's the glory of the Lord's moving this place. Just lift your hands, everybody. Lift your hands and receive from the Lord right now. He's here. He's here. Just receive from him. Whatever it is you need, just receive right now. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome in this place, Holy Fresh dry Christians. We give you liberty, Lord, to have your total way. Yes, Whatever Lord. you desire for this service, Holy Spirit, be it lifted. Hallelujah. On Father's Day, this Sunday will be a year ago. Something happened in this church that we've been praying for for two and a half years. Our church had been in intercession we didn't really understand it all at that time but later we learned it was intercession we've been praying around a revival banner as well as 11 other banners we had 12 of them total the revival banner was already always on that side over there by the staircase and my wife was in charge of that banner and we prayed and I remember some of the most fervent prayer that would go up on Sunday nights in this place was always around the revival banner but on Father's Day we came in this church 
morning as we were over there praying on this side of the church, Brother Steve went down off the platform to pray for the first person. He was just planning on being here one service. And as he walked down off the platform to pray for the first person, it was a man. And I walked down off the platform with him, and as I was standing there with Brother Steve, I had my hand on his back and I had, a man on, had my hand on the man's shoulder. As we were praying, I heard what sounded like behind me, a rushing mighty wind. It sounded like that, you know, just, and I turned, because I couldn't, I, I thought at first maybe it was static in the sound system, and I recognized it didn't sound like that, so I turned to see what it was, and as I turned to my right to look behind me, uh, it came evidently from behind my legs, right down below my calves and my legs here around my ankles, and my, an my ankles flipped just like that, my legs bowed out, and it came through right from behind my legs. And I guess the Lord brought it in through the federal headship of the church. And when he did, I couldn't move my legs. I could not get my legs up. I've been pastoring here for 14 years. And my people pretty well knows me. They know that I don't fake that kind of stuff. And when I couldn't get my leg up to move because a lady just fell in front of me, a young man down here in the black suit, Tony Taylor, came and took me by my pants leg and walked me back up on the platform. And I stood right here, leaned up on the pulpit because I wasn't able to stand up hardly. And I yelled out to the church, I said, folks, get in. This is what we've been praying for. Get in now. And as soon as I said that, it was just like somebody hurled dynamite in three different directions out in the church like that. And it just, the power of God exploded. Like I was standing up here and saw it. It was like the glory just came and exploded. And people fell in huge circles, just boom, boom, boom. And they fell on the floor like they were gunned down on the battlefield. And then up here where a thousand people had gathered for prayer on that Sunday morning on Father's Day, the Spirit of God just boom, exploded up here. And we were in revival, and it hasn't stopped yet. Can you say amen? We've seen, we've seen over 25,000 souls saved. 25,000 souls saved. There's been better than 700,000 people through these doors since last Father's Day, and I'll tell you why they come. People do not come to see a man, because if they do, they'll be disappointed. They're not coming to see a man, they're not coming to hear a sermon, and they're not coming under a denominational banner, but they're coming to see the Lord, they're hungry for the Lord. What this revival, what this revival is all about is God's bringing people in, and now he's doing it all over the nation and other churches also. It may have started here, but it was already in other ch churches in the world before it even came here. We don't take any glory for any of that. God just happened to choose this place for reasons unknown to us. But the glory of God came in this place, and he's still here. And I just wanted to say to you before we dismiss you just a moment for a quick break that there's a river that flows through this church going to call people up in just a few moments and pray for them for salvation. Altar call will be given. There'll be hundreds of people that will come forward and receive the Lord tonight as their Savior, not only here, but in the chapel across the street. The chapel across the street is full tonight, but also they're back in the cafeteria. Our cafeteria holds about 400 people, and I think they're almost full back there. And uh, people will come to the Lord by the hundreds tonight in the service. And friend... I don't understand it, but God, God has sent a refreshing to the world. The other churches have got a refreshing, but this seems to be a revival. This includes a refreshing. It always happens toward the end of the service. We pray for people, but this is a revival where God is reviving his people here, not just refreshing them, but reviving them. And over 25,000 souls have come forward. We've seen them of all shapes, sizes all backgrounds and I'm telling you some cheapest of sinners have come in this place and been saved. We've got some powerful testimonies we're going to share after our break here in just a few minutes. But God is moving mightily. And I want to just tell you before we take our break that God is going to touch you tonight. Many of you have paid a price to get here. Many of you have sacrificed to be here. You've traveled a long distance to get here and you've been really hungry for a touch of God in your life. And God is going to touch you. He's going to kiss your soul. What we call it here in this revival is God's going to kiss your soul. And I want to tell you something else, friend. Listen, if you're one of those Christians that's always on that treadmill of always trying to perform to please the Lord, you can forget it in this revival. 
God's not touching perfect people in this revival. He's just touching people. People just like me and people just like you that needs the Lord. And uh, people are dry. They're hurting. Their marriages are suffering. The devil's moved in their homes. People have been tormented and harassed by the devil in their minds. Sick and afflicted. The devil has afflicted of God's people and oppressed them with sickness and disease. And friend, I won't say we've seen it all, but I think we've seen just about all of it in a year's revival. And I want to tell you, there's nothing that you're going through that's too great for our God. Nothing. I don't care what it is. I'll tell you a quick story. Be seated just a minute. Let me tell you a quick story, and I'll let you be dismissed. I want to tell you this. This is so important. We've seen several months ago, there was a man whose girlfriend was killed earlier that day on a Friday. She was murdered. And there was a, a little girl that had been to the revival, nine years old. God finally touched her in the revival. And we tell people when God touches you, go out and share what he's done for you and share it with others and invite them to come. And let them get in on what God's doing. That's what we tell them. So this little girl got touched a week before, and she went out and uh, told her neighbor. She lived in Fort Walton, Florida. And she went and told her neighbor, she said, oh, you've got to come with me to church. And just to sort of get rid of her, I guess, you know, he said, well, okay. He said, I'll go with you. She said, when? He said, next week. I'll go with you next Friday. So that next Friday, earlier in the day, her, his girlfriend was murdered. And he felt like he knew who murdered his girlfriend, so he took a revolver and stuck it down in his pants and was headed out the door to go kill the man that killed his girlfriend. And whenever he left out the door, was leaving out the door to go kill this individual, this little girl knocked on the door. She said, hi. She said, uh, it's, we got church in about two hours. He said, get out of the way, girl. He said, I'm busy. I ain't got time to talk to you right now. She said, but you told me that you was going to go with me to church next week. And she said, here it is next week. Let's go. He said, look, I don't have time for you. I've got things to do. Move out of the way. And he was so adamant about it, but she was adamant as he was. She took her little legs and wrapped her legs inside his legs and wrapped her arms inside his arms. And she said, God just told me that if you leave this house, you'll never come back alive. that's so stunned him because he knew he had murder in his heart and blood was dripping from his fingers already it so stunned him he said all right so he drove down here with that little girl and came to church on that Friday night and it was an awesome service a mighty altar call was given and he was one of the first ones to land in home base <laughs> and <laughs> Steve and I when he reached in his pants like that and pulled that revolver out and laid it up here, I mean, that's, that's startling, folks. You know, you don't know if he's going to shoot you. You know, we don't know what's going to happen, but he pulled that revolver out and laid it up here. And he said, I was on my way to kill a man when that little girl wrapped her legs and arms around me and said, but God said, if you leave here, you'll never come back alive. Friend, God's moving in this land. And I want to tell you something. There's a, go ahead. Before, before God poured out revival in this church, for a long time, I said, God, I'd say it to my wife, and I said it to the Lord so many times in prayer. I know I sounded like a broken record before him. I'd say, God, I remember when I was growing up in Pentecost, I saw things. I experienced things. I said, Lord, I hadn't seen them in a long time. I hadn't felt them in a long time. I said, God, are you still doing it? Are you still doing it? And I had stone silence. I'd get up and preach many times, and I'd feel a powerful anointing, and God would move in the church, and we'd have some souls saved, and we'd have some people filled with the Holy Spirit. But there was just nothing really happening in America. You could get on a plane and fly to any city in America on any given Sunday, and there was just nothing really happening. And I began to question God. I said, God, what's going on? Dr. Cho questioned the Lord, too, while he was in Seattle. Many of you haven't heard this prophecy, and I'll tell you real quick before we take our break, because there's so many strangers and visitors here. Dr. Cho was in Seattle, Washington, 
And one of our ladies was there and heard him give this prophecy, and she flew straight home and told me about it. And this was in 1991, and it just sort of went off my, off up me like water off a duck's back. I didn't pay that much attention to it. But she was so excited by what she heard. And after God did what Dr. Cho said he would do, then it began to dawn on me what God was up to all along. But Dr. Cho was in Seattle, and he said, God, he said, have you reserved America for judgment, or are you going to pour out your spirit in America? And... He said, Lord, you're pouring out your spirit in Africa. You're pouring out your spirit in the former Soviet Union mightily. You're pouring out your spirit in the Orient. But God, nothing in the world is going on in America. What in the world is going on? Have you reserved us for judgment? Is a bomb coming? And so while he was in prayer, he said the Lord spoke to him while he was in that hotel room in Seattle and said, go to your attache case and get out your atlas, your world atlas. He said he got his world atlas out and he came back and Open it up to America, open it up to the United States, and the Holy Spirit said, now point. And he said he pointed his finger, and his finger went right on top of the little dot of Pensacola, Florida, on the Gulf Coast. And the Lord said to him, he said, I have not reserved America for judgment. But he said, I will pour out my spirit in America first in Pensacola, Florida. And he said it will burn like a match head first there, bright and intense. And he said, then it will move toward Mobile, Alabama, and then it will... He said, then it will move over to New Orleans. And by the way, that's all right, go ahead, New Orleans, go ahead. <laughs> by the way, when the Spanish first came and settled here in this area, Pensacola was the capital of the Spanish, of the Spanish uh, rule. And it went all the way over to the Mississippi River, and we call it the Mississippi River, but you know what the Spanish called it whenever they first settled in this area and made Pensacola the capital? They call the, Pen uh, the Mississippi River the River of the Holy Spirit. That's what they called it. I forget how you say it in Spanish, River D.L. Cresto or something like that. They call it the River of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Cho said that, that it was going to go all the way over to the Mississippi River, and then it would swoop back down to the peninsula of Florida, it would jut all the way up through the eastern seaboard of the United States. It would sweep back down through the Midwest, shoot down into the Southwest, and then go out through the Northwest, and all of America would be ablaze with the glory of God. <clears throat> Can you say hallelujah? <clears throat> and friend... I want to tell you something. Listen to me. One of the things I appreciate so much about this revival is there's nothing fabricated. We didn't do anything to bring this revival. Sure, we prayed for two and a half years and really sought God for revival because I cut my spiritual teeth on revival at Riverview Assembly of God in Columbus, Georgia. My pastor was a mighty man of God, but I knew that revival was going to come. I believed that it was, and I hoped that it was. But there's nothing conjured up in this revival. And we're trying to pastor it. If anybody gets out of line or really gets in the flesh, we'll deal with it. You don't compassionately deal with it, that kind of thing. But this thing is being pastored. We're all here every night, same people on the platform. I'm here, there's a pastor. And Brother Steve Hill, evangelist, he's here. Basically the same worship team. Brother Lindell is here. So we're pastoring this thing. And uh, we didn't conjure anything up. God just moved in here sovereignly. And we thank him for what he's done. But now... You see, he's not only moving in Brownsville, but he's moving in many other churches throughout this nation. And he's moving in all denominations. As a matter of fact, some of the first ones to jump in the river was the Baptists. That's right. And not only that, but we have Methodist pastors come in on Friday night. Tomorrow night, you need to be... <laughs> Go ahead. Methodists. How many Methodists we got here tonight? <laughs> They're vocal. But we have Methodist pastors come in here on Friday night, and they help us baptize, immerse people in water. They don't sprinkle. They get up there in the baptismal pool and help us baptize. We have, we have all different denominations represented in the Bible. There's Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal. There's born-again Catholic people. We have Messianic Jews. We have Charismatic, Pentecostal. We have all kinds of people. So they gather up this big canopy called Brownsville Assembly, but this is not a Brownsville thing. It's just a gathering place. And we tell pastors, you know, if you want to send your people here, I want every pastor to feel confident that you can send your people here, and we'll take care of your people. We're not going to let anything strange go on in this church. We, we're trying to pastor. We want this to be a revival that Jesus will be proud of. 
And by that I mean we want it to be scriptural. We want it to be something that we feel like that we're providing a, a format for Holy Spirit to move freely. But at the same time, we don't want to hinder the Holy Spirit. We don't want to condone everything, you know, that goes on. But yet at the same time, we don't want to control this either. We just want God to be God. And there's so many people that's hungry today for God. So many people that's so dry and so hungry and haven't felt God in so long. I mean, really genuinely felt God. Folks, let me tell you something. As a pastor of this church, I never thought, and I, I knew God as a boy. I, we had some mighty things happen, but I never knew it was possible to feel God like I feel Him today. I never knew it was possible. I never knew that it was possible to have the waves of the glory just shoot through you and take your breath. I never knew what it meant to wake up in the morning at 10 minutes after 7 for the first time and, and my shoulder blades banging the headboard so loud, shaking under the power of God that my wife had to get up and go to another room to sleep. And I got into bed that morning at 5 o'clock and I asked God, I said, God, why couldn't you have done this at 2? You know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm tired. But the Holy Ghost, I woke up in the bed one morning and the bed was shaking and I thought, well, what is Brenda doing? You know. And I thought, well, good grief, man. I got into bed at 5. I'm, what is she doing? So I flipped over like that in anger, and I looked at her, and she was just, you know, she's still as she could be. And then I laid back down. I felt the bed moving again, and I said, wait a minute. That's me. And then I was set up in the bed like that, and when I did, my shoulder blades began to bang that backboard, and I said, Lord, my God, this is strange. <laughs> but folks, listen, if you can identify everything God's doing, it's not revival. But whenever God moves in and God does what God wants to do and we let God be God, that's revival. Amen? Amen. So I just wanted to say to you tonight, don't, don't get your mind fixed on how everything's going to be. Don't get your mind fixed on somebody around you that may be jerking or shaking or falling out under the power of God. You see, one of the things that happened when this thing first broke out is God touched me so mightily. And he did things to me that he has never done in my life before. And I behaved in ways that I never behaved before whenever the Spirit of God would come on me. That when I would look out and see people that ordinarily I would have sat down or said, you take a seat. Now, after God had touched me, I looked at them and I said, yeah, I can understand that. I can handle that. Yeah, I see that. You know, I, I could do that myself. Power of God, come on me. So there's been very few things in this revival that we've laid our hand on and said, you know, take them out and let them calm down out in the foyer or something like that. There's been very few things. And whenever you see some of these teenagers going through here and they're doing like this, you know, and all kind of crazy stuff, just sort of sit back and look at it and say, I think after the services, after we open up the altars, I think uh, after the pastor opens the altars, I think I'm going to ask that young man to pray for me. See? Just be open. Be open, folks. Let God be God. Be open. I'll tell you what, whenever Paul came to the island of Belito, you remember, when he started adding sticks to the fire, a snake jumped out and bit him. You remember? When he started adding sticks to the fire, a snake jumped up and bit him. But the alternative is, if you don't add sticks to the fire, you freeze to death. So you got an option either freeze to death in your dead, cold, dry religion or add sticks to the fire and draw the devil after you. Amen? Amen? I'm so tired of being cold, I'm ready to add some sticks to the fire. Amen? God bless you. Stand up, if you will, everybody, and we're going to take about a 10-minute break. And, uh, you know, it might be wise unless you have to go to the bathroom you might just take this break and stay in your seat because if you leave, somebody may get your seat. I don't know. We're not going to make any promises. And uh, we prayed for him right over there by the side. And God, God spoke to my heart that he was, the Lord was going to use him, expand his ministry that uh, outside of writing. He's a very creative writer, very able writer, but God was going to use him in, in his, with his power. There was going to be power anointing flowing through him and so um, this is just part of the Pentecostal Evangel article that's coming out, I believe, this Sunday. But it says, when Charisma editor Lee Grady phoned me, this is from Hal Donaldson. He is the editor of the Pentecostal Evangel. He's the one that puts it all together. He says, when Charisma editor Lee Grady phoned me, it was obvious he was a man.
I want to tell you, friend, I don't care where you're at with your Christian life, you can leave out of here with more. Okay? Now, what I love about this is Lee is an Episcopalian. He was obvious a new man. He had just visited Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola, Florida, where God had touched him in an unusual way. He was calling to suggest we pray together while attending the Evangelical Press Association Convention in Colorado Springs. Lee called him and said, we need to pray together. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but it's delicious. Then he says right here, when we met in my hotel room, I shared with Lee my desire for more of God. That's a prerequisite, friend. How many want more of the Lord? You got to you gotta have hunger, friend. We, can spend, we, could, we could spread a seven-course meal in front of you, but if you don't come eat, you got to have hunger. As we prayed and spoke in tongues, the Holy Spirit moved on me in a way I never witnessed. I wept for nearly two hours as what I felt like waves of electricity shot through my right arm and down my spine, causing my body to tremble. And I read that. It goes on and tells about what happened to him. But I read this, friends, and I thought, now that's cool. See, there's an Episcopalian praying for a Pentecostal. You know? And this is another article. I probably shouldn't be doing this because they just sent it to me to proof it. And here I am reading it. But um, this is coming out in the Pentecostal Evangel all about the Brownsville Revival and the Pastors Conference that we held recently up in Springfield. But I just want to read what they're saying about this revival. Now, this magazine, for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, is printed and distributed among millions and millions of believers, not just the Assemblies of God. It goes all over the world. But it says this. He talks about what's happening here, the power of God's coming down, and we went up to Springfield, and the same thing happened there. The power of God hit that place, and some of our national leaders were hit, struck by the power of the Lord. Would you say, glory to God? It is time. But he says, in Pensacola, there is, an unde there is undeniable fruit. God is being glorified. Thousands are finding Jesus. Believers are experiencing renewal. May we be preoccupied with praying this revival sweeps across our nation. May we be consumed by a personal hunger for God. This time, let's leave the scrutiny. I love this. This time, let's leave the scrutiny to someone else and ask God to have his way. And by the way, up in, uh, up in Springfield, he was hit by the power. Hal Donaldson was hit by the power and went straight down. Now, he's not experiencing this at all before, but uh, he hit the carpet and was shaken violently when we were up there. And he closes it by saying, The people of Brownsville Assembly of God believe a spiritual awakening has already begun in America. Those of us who attended the meeting in Springfield are more convinced than ever. And for me, it didn't take a rug burn on my nose to know God is doing something fresh and exciting in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I remember right before God poured out revival here at the church, I was so hungry for God. I mean, I was, I was so hungry for God. It was like a, a thirsty man in a desert. I couldn't get enough of him. I mean, I was watching... Bill Clinton and Billy Graham out in Oklahoma City when they was in that hangar out there having that memorial service for the people killed, you remember, in Oklahoma City in the bombing? And I was watching the memorial service on Sunday afternoon before we came to church on that Sunday night. Billy Graham was just out there speaking in that memorial service. And the Spirit of God come on me so strong watching him. I'm not a crier. I've never, I've never been one to cry much. And when you see me cry, brother, it means something. I broke down and started sobbing in my den and my wife and I was getting ready for church and she looked at me like are you okay and I went back there to get dressed I couldn't even hardly see how to get dressed I was sobbing so hard we came in church that Sunday night and it was a wonderful service but I remember uh, right before revival broke out I guess it was probably January or February I think it was around January I was leaving out of the of the house one morning and I was going to to the office and as I was walking across my floor in my den I heard Pat Robertson say, in just a few moments, he said, Billy, Benny Hinn is going to come, and he has a word for America. And he said, he's going to tell us about revival. God has shown him revival is about to break out in America. I stopped dead in my tracks. 
I put my keys on a counter and I went back in the den and sat down in my chair. I couldn't wait for that commercial to be over. In just a few minutes it was over. And Benny Hinn came on television and he said, uh, uh, Pat Robertson introduced him, he said, yes, that's right, Brother Robertson. He said, uh, he said, revival is coming to America. He said, the Lord has shown me that he's going to come. And he said, he's going to start in the month of March. I think he said the month of March. Maybe he came on in the month of March and maybe he said he's going to start in the month of June. I forget which it was now. But it was near in a short period of time. And he said, the Lord said that revival is going to come and it's going to start, I think, in either March or June. I forget which it was. And he said, it's going to start in some places before it will start in other places. But a mighty spirit and a mighty wave of revival is going to come in America. And I want to tell the American churches, get ready and get their hearts prepared for a move of God. And he said, I'm going to pray. And I remember I got down on my knees and I crawled up to the television set. And I laid my hands. I've never done that. Never, never. And I, I crawled up to the t TV set on my knees and I put my hands on the screen and I said, Jesus, I said, if you move in America, when you move in America, I said, please, please don't pass Brownsville Assembly by. Please. I said, I ask you, please, when you pour out revival, please come to Brownsville. And I want to say this to you, friends. Revival is coming to America. It's already started. And maybe it's already started in your church. But if it hasn't started in your church and maybe your pastor doesn't seem too turned on by it, don't you fight your pastor. You pray for your pastor. You love on your pastor. And don't push things down his throat. You know, don't push the Allison video and all those things down his throat. Just pray for him and love on him. And just intercede for your pastor and intercede for your church. But I believe that revival is tied up in that pastor. God will not violate the federal headship of that church. And God can soften his heart. But men of God, I want to say to those of you that's here tonight, pastors here across the street, back in our cafeteria, those that are here, if you'll just open up your heart to the Lord Jesus, afresh and anew, and just humble yourself before him and say, Lord, I've tried everything I can, and anything I've tried hasn't really worked. I'm dry, Lord. I feel indifferent. I feel cold. Religion has got a hold of my church. Religion's got a hold of me. And God, I just would like to yield now and ask you to come and send revival to my church. You don't have to pray a big prayer. You don't have to beat the floor or beat the altar. Just tell Holy Spirit. And I promise you, there's such a wind now, the Holy Spirit moving in this land, he'll move right through your church just like that. He'll come just like that. But don't fight. Don't fight your pastor. Don't fight him. Just love him and pray for him. And God's going to send revival. It's coming. Now, we're going to take time tonight for just a few testimonies. I don't want over three or four. But I'd like to have some powerful testimonies of those here in the church that God has done something special for you in the revival. If it's revival related, if God's done something really special for you, touched your life in a special way, or done something really outstanding in your life, and you'd like to give glory to God for it, I just want you to stand up real quick. Wherever you may be, just stand up real quick. All right, keep standing. There's several more of you. Stand up. Come on up, honey. Y'all come on up, both of y'all. Let's take one more. Anybody over here on this side? What's God done for you? Come on up. Let's get four. Come on up. Let's get one man. Good gracious. These four women. Where's one man? Where's a man? Come on up. I think the Lord's on him. Amen. All right. What's your name and where are you from? Melissa. I'm from Boca Raton, Florida. What, what's going on? What happened? Got a few days. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for the longest time that I can remember, I've been on medications for manic depressiveness. And uh, as last of uh, October, I was fighting suicidal feelings and feeling unworthy of living and had shock treatments and stuff and got so depressed that, you know, I just didn't want to live anymore and have any direction in my life. And uh, one of the things I really longed for was to have a baby, and now I'm going to have one. And I'm 40 years old, and I've waited a long time, but it's in God's time, not my time. And in this last year, I've seen a lot of miracles in my life. My house is burned down. I have a new home now. 
I would have never been able to afford unless God touched my heart with it. I've been in a car accident, and God protected me through it, sending down an angel to protect me between that car that hit me. Um, just a few weeks ago, my boyfriend hit a man, and I was going to go with him in the car and uh, decide to go to church instead. And um, when I, he came home that night, he showed me the car, and the whole windshield was smashed in on the side that I would have been sitting on. I felt the Lord had led me to go to church that night, especially, and um, the Lord has just blessed me in so many ways that um, I can't thank him enough. God bless you. Thank you, baby. Thank you very much. Hi. What's your name? Tell us where you're from. My name is Verna, and I'm from Mobile. Okay. Your testimony? I, too, I guess it would take all night, but in short, I'll tell you that on the 28th of April of this year, the Lord really touched me. Um, I had a, a new friend who is now a very close friend to me that asked me to go to church with him that day, and I had turned him down many times for various reasons. Um, I could think of them all. But we did go to church that morning. Um, I'm a realtor, so I did an open house that afternoon, and we decided to go to church again that night. And I can remember I was a I was thinking, well, we're going to a different church tonight than we did this morning. And when we got there, um, the parking lot was full. The church had started at a different time. And uh, they were having a revival. We weren't on time. And I remember my friend saying, well, I know somewhere we can go. We won't be late. And he turned around to leave. And I can remember saying, gee, you sure are churchy, aren't you? You know, we were going to another church. And um, he laughed. He said, yeah, I guess I'm kind of churchy. And I just had no idea what would happen to me that night in church. Um, I had been in an accident a few years ago, and my neck was really in bad shape. I was sick and a lot of pain. And um, that night in church, I saw, as we were standing there in prayer, the altar call, and I could see all these people going forward for what I hoped I'd have. But I was so sick, I really didn't think I could even get to the altar. And God told me, you don't have to go to that altar. And I felt my friend put his arm up on, his hand up on my shoulder, and I felt more love and a, a warmth that went through me like I had never felt before. I wasn't aware of what was happening, but church dismissed, and we left out the door, and... I heard someone call my name and I turned around to look and no one was there and of course no one would know me. I was, I was new there, I was a visitor. And then it hit me that there just wasn't any pain anymore. That pain that I'd been racked with for so long was not there. And I had also done to the, I had turned to the right completely all the way around, and I, could, I couldn't even turn my head to the right. I was, I was very excited about it, but I was also afraid to even mention it. I, kept, I guess I looked like a goose or something, just turning my neck all over the place to see if it was really that way. And finally, when he asked me what had happened or what was my problem, because I was just working my neck every way, I told him, and... We were driving at the time, and I thought he was going to wreck. But um, I was healed and saved at the same time that night. It was just a miracle. Hi. Okay. My friend offered to buy me a new Bible because I didn't even know where mine was anymore. I hate to say that, but I didn't. And tonight I'm carrying that Bible. I, he had asked me, what would I like on my Bible? Would I like my initials or my name or what? And um, that night I kept him up almost all night. He was wanting to leave and go home um, to let me go to sleep. I had to go to work the next morning. And I was afraid to go to sleep. I told him I was afraid if I went to sleep, it may be just a dream and it wouldn't be there the next morning. And um, he laughed at me. He finally went home, and the next morning, um, I called him two and a half hours later, and I said, I've still got it. It's still there, and I'm so excited. But I'm carrying that Bible tonight, and I'm very proud of it. He, 
I said, I know what I want on my Bible now, and it says, born April 28th, 1996. What's your name? My name is Debbie, and I'm from Gordonsville, Tennessee. Gordonsville, Tennessee. What happened to you? A couple from our church came um, a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, to, to the revival here, and it, it it just started changing our church. They came back, and, and when they, she came into my house to tell me about it, you could see the countenance on her face. Just her, she looked, she looked different. We got, so a few weeks ago, my husband and daughter, and their daughter, and, and I got to come back, and the Lord t touched us at that time, just in a special way. But what has changed is that I'm a pastor's daughter, and sometimes I've told people, I get them, I'm surprised at pastor's children being saved because they see how their pastors and their families are treated at different times. And the last several months, it was like it, you, you had testified. People that I thought were our best, best friends in church had quit. They got mad over nothing. I don't even know what they got mad about because they told everybody but us. They, people started leaving and it hurts. And you think, God, where'd you go? What happened? The, then the couple came to this church, and then we got to come to the revival. We came back. Since that time, God has sent new workers, people that, that not only that need us, but that we need. He has, we have had revival at every open service for the last several weeks. We've had people filled with the Holy Ghost. We've had people, people baptized, people coming to the Lord. And the, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The change that's on the people's face, the change that's in their hearts, and it's put revival back in there. And it's like, oh, thank you. Just thank you. Thank you. And a sign that, that it gave my dad, when if this first happened and, and came back and just the different movements and all the excitement and the laughing and some of the things that we were doing in the spirit, this was kind of new for him too. And so he, he said he woke up one morning and after it first happened, and my dad had a lot of problems with his knees, particularly his right knee. Sometimes he would be almost crippled with it. He couldn't walk. And uh, the left knee hurt some, but the right knee hurt tremendously. He had been to the doctor. He woke up one morning, and he woke up, and he said, he told him the church, he said, the Lord talked to me this morning. I think I heard from the Lord. He said, he told me, he said, I'm going to heal your right leg so that you know that everything you're seeing is of me. I'm going to leave the left leg like it is so you don't forget. <laughs> Is he good? Oh, yes, yes. He has had not. He, there's been no pain. His right leg is completely healed. The left knee is just an aggravation, but that's okay. <laughs> but God is just—he's he, coming to our church, and I'm just so thankful for the Holy Ghost that just the Spirit that just moves back and forth. I'm so thankful for the revival that's just moving up, and for the people that the people that He's sending that want to worship Him and want to work for Him. You know what I found out? I found out that people that's not really committed to God and they've just got religion on them and they're churchy and they don't really have a real experience with Jesus, a lot of those people are just sort of falling off to the side. They're becoming cynical and critical. But man, there's a whole horde of people that's hungry after God and God's bringing them in. It's wonderful. God bless you. Hi. What's your name? Jack Hill. I'm from uh, Grand Saline, Texas. Any kin to Steve Hill? Well, he's uh, just a friend. <laughs> <laughs> What's happened? What's happened over Texas? Well, uh, this is my second time down here. Uh, I came originally to see my uh, my son Jeff Gardner, who was with uh, Steve, and see how Steve is doing and check out this revival. And I came down to get blessed. Well, now when I get blessed, I got uh, delivered. Uh, it was a Saturday night, and uh, Steve was preaching on uh, being stuck with uh, baggages and bondages and every other thing, you know. And uh, he says uh, drugs, alcohol, and, and he, he named Prozac. And I've been praying to the Lord. I says I want to get off this junk. And he said Prozac. I went up for prayer. Dick got a hold of me, and 
I asked my wife what he said because I don't remember. And uh, he's all Dick says is, now. <laughs> and then the rug burns a little bit, you know. <laughs> And uh, Pat said, uh, well, he said that uh, you need to flush it down the toilet. So I got up the next morning, and I took my medicine, and I flushed it down the toilet. So I guess all the rats are pretty mellow around here. Uh, but I haven't been, uh, I haven't had that pill since that day, and uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is gone. Wow. Saved me. <laughs> when did he save you? May twenty third, nineteen ninety six. May the twenty third. So you're about two weeks old in the Lord then, right? About three. <laughs> about three weeks old? Um, yeah. I've what, what religious background were you before you got saved? Non-denominational. Non-denominational? My grandfather's a pastor, and I've been in church all my life. And what I, happened? <laughs> I've been avoiding the Lord for about four years, ever since I started high school. And I knew that I didn't care. I thought I had time when I was older. I avoided coming here. My grandfather asked me to come every week, and I wouldn't go because I thought I didn't need to come go out of Mobile to come here. And then you came to Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord started working in me then, and I decided I had to go. And May 23rd, which is Thursday, I rededicated my life. I got saved. I the Lord saved me that day. <laughs> you didn't get rededicated. You got saved. And ever since then, I've been living my life for the Lord. And I want to stay like this, like a baby Christian the rest of my life. Well, how do you feel? <laughs> I feel good. good. And I want to thank the Lord. Because <laughs> I've been telling people about Brownsville, all my friends. And nobody really wanted to come. And this weekend, they're coming. But I, I had, I had to, I had to bribe them. I had to pay. I'm paying for a hotel room Saturday night, and paying for all their food. And I had the money because I graduated this year, and I decided that that money could go to that. Today, I walked in the door, and my aunt handed me an envelope that said, To Brooke Lash, for the Brownsville weekend, may God bless you, and there's a hundred dollars in it for that, and I don't know who was going My name's Danny Barron. I was uh, stationed here in the Navy in flight training. 
came here it was in 1985. I came, uh, I was in the uh, young adult Sunday school class. The Holy Spirit began to speak through the teacher and uh, yes sir. okay to make a long story short I went out into the parking lot and I confessed my sin to God for being jealous of the teacher for being used of God and I confessed my sin and asked God to forgive me he began to the, then I felt an urge to pray for this church the Holy Spirit began to show me things in the spirit what to pray for and so I started to pray, speaking things that I had seen God show to me. And I prayed that God would send a revival here. And that it would be through a visiting minister. It would not be through the pastor. I prayed that it would be as, uh, I, pray, I pray that the, the glory of the Lord would be here in a, in a way that they could see in a, like a cloud. I prayed that the glory of the Lord would be as waves in, this, in the ocean, could steady and consistent as the sea. I prayed that God would send other people from other denominations into this church and that he would baptize them in the Holy Ghost. And he would send them out and the revival would catch in their churches. I prayed that people would come from all over the United States and that they would feel the power of God and go back to their churches and, and take it with them. Um, that's all. Thank you. Lendl. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Before we come to receive the offering and Brother Steve comes to preach, let's, uh, let me sing a little chorus to you. It goes, more of your glory, more of your power, more of your spirit in me. Speak to my heart and change my life. Manifest yourself in me. Sing with me. More of your glory. More of your glory. More of your power. More of your power. More of your spirit. More of your spirit in me. In me. Speak to my heart. Speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. Manifest, Manifest yourself. Manifest yourself in me. Sing it with me, everybody. More of your glory. More of your power, more of your spirit in me. Speak to my heart and change my life. Manifest yourself in me. Sing with me more of your glory, everybody. More of your glory. More of your power. More of your power. More of your spirit. More of your spirit in me. Speak to my heart. Speak to my heart, change my life, and change my life, manifest yourself, manifest yourself in me. Sing it to the Lord. Send your glory. Send your glory. Oh, sing to the Lord. Send your power. Send your power. Send your spirit. Send your spirit. Send your spirit. Come and change me. Come and change me. Send your glory, yes, Lord. Send Come, Holy Spirit, glory. sing with me. Send your power. Send your power. Send your spirit. Send your spirit. Lord, come and change me. Change me till I'm everything you want me to be. Power, more of your power, more of your 
your spirit in me. Speak to my heart and change my life. Manifest yourself in me. Sing it to the Lord. I want more. More of your glory. More of your power. More of your spirit. More of your spirit in me. Speak to my heart. Speak to my heart and change my life. Manifest yourself in me. Amen. Give the Lord a praise tonight. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your wonderful yeah. presence tonight, Lord. We glorify your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How many of you tonight are here from out of town tonight? How many? My Lord. Welcome them. A few Brownsville folks here, but welcome them anyway. Thank you for coming. Come on, welcome them here tonight. Amen. Amen. You can be seated for just a few moments, and we'll come right back into praise and worship. But we want to give you an opportunity to sow seed into wonderful soil. You know, one of the things that, amen, few of you are happy about it because you know that it grows, amen? Amen. We do have expenses. We thank you so very much for helping us with these expenses. And the thing that I like about what's going on here at Brownsville is fertile soil. For so many of you that are visiting tonight for the first time, I'll guarantee you that if you sow into this soil, it's productive soil. You know, the key to giving in the kingdom of God is not the, 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 the seed, because all of us have seed. The key is finding fertile soil. So tonight, as the ushers come, if you'll come quickly, we want to give you the opportunity. We don't take up offerings here. We just give you and offer you the opportunity to sow into fertile soil, because fertile soil produces a harvest. Remember, if you're from another church tonight, your tithe does not go as your offering. Your tithe goes to your home church. Please say that. My tithe goes to my home church. But we do also know that the Bible talks about offerings. So tonight, if you'll help us in an offering to continue this wonderful work of God, I know that this fertile ground will produce a wonderful harvest. Father, we thank you for all of those that you're sending in. Lord, I don't know where they come from, but I know we have about 250 million more in the United States that need to come. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of sowing seed into fertile soil because, Lord, you said that all we do is find the fertile soil, sow the seed, and expect a harvest. We expect it in giving, Lord God. We expect also the harvest. Thank you, Lord, for these precious saints who have come. Bless them, Lord, as they give. And, Father, return to them that bountiful harvest. As they sow, so shall they reap. Those that sow sparingly shall reap sparingly, but Lord, those that sow bountifully shall also reap the bountiful harvest. God bless them as they give, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, and thank you so very much. Calling us to a higher place Calling us out of complacency, Lord To be your bride, to be your church
of the sovereign Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news the spirit of the sovereign God is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news he has sent you to the poor to bind up the broken hearted to bring freedom to the captive to release the ones in darkness. This is the year. It's the year of the favor of the Lord. This is the day. It's the day of the vengeance of our God. Sovereign God is upon us because He has anointed us to preach good news. Oh, the Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon us. He has anointed us to preach good news. Comfort all the Lord. This is the He will provide for those who grieve in Zion. This is the day. He is pouring out His oil of gladness. This is the year. Instead of mourning, we will pray. calling you out of your comfort zone saying to you come out of complacency the harvest is ripe today he's sending laborers to gather in the harvest for the day of the Lord is at hand this is the year this is the year. It's the year of the favor of the Lord. This is the year. It's the year of the vengeance of our God. This is the year of the favor of the Lord. This is the day. has sent us to the poor this is a year to bind up the broken heart this is a day to bring freedom to the captives this is a year to release and set free the ones in darkness hallelujah this is the year
Well, I felt from the beginning of this service something's about to happen. And uh, for those of you visiting, how many are here for the first time? Would you lift your hand? We welcome you. We want you to understand that um, these services have been going on since Father's Day. I've had the blessed privilege of preaching 270 times in a row. And it's been an honor, and it is an honor, continues to be an honor, to preach in this revival. And it's so important for you to understand, those of you that are visiting, that every service is different. Because it, it's, it's so easy to miss God by coming and saying, and I remember one woman who came into the revival was here for an hour, and she went outside, she said, well, I've been to the Brownsville revival. And I go, that's ridiculous. Every service is different in this place. I come every night expecting something new from the Lord. See, this is not a drudgery at all. This is a joy. And I'm, I'm after some stuff. I've mentioned it in this revival. We've seen awesome uh, manifestations of the power of God come down in this place. But I'm looking forward to the time where we all walk in here and just maybe in a, a split second of the service, lightning hits this place. And I mean, and not only everyone here and in the chapel, there's about, Richard, I think, has six or seven hundred in the chapel. There's folks in the lunchroom. Not only all of us are hit by the power of God, but cars swerve suddenly off the road out front. I'm longing for the day, friends, where folks that are at Walmart, you know, and the checkout lines are just jolted by the power of the Lord. And, We've had services here, friend, where God has just come down, melted us. Sinners have fallen from the pews. There's going to be many like that ahead. It's going to happen. But I want you to understand that we come into this place every time I crawl into this building. I feel like a worm. I go, God, you know, we're not taking this revival for granted. And if you would allow us to be part of one more service, if you would just come down one more time, Jesus, if you just save a few more, heal a few more, refresh a few more, and let us be a small part of it, Jesus. God, I just want to be where you're at. So tonight, I encourage every one of you, we're going to have prayer in just a few minutes. After I preach this message, I want Charity, if you'd come and, and sit where Brother Wetzel's at right now. He's going to sit next to Pastor. Charity's going to sing a song called Run to the Mercy Seat. Many of you, look at me, everybody. Many of you that are away from the Lord are going to come to Jesus in just a few minutes. That's why you're here. You might as well face it. All right? You might as well face it. We've watched it, friends. And I'm going to tell you something else, sir, that's been happening in these services. This is going to spook some of you. But there's a scripture in the Bible. There's a portion of scripture. I believe it's Acts chapter 9 where there was this man. He might have been riding on a mule. He might have been walking. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but he's on his way to Damascus to mess up some Christians. And uh, basically, you know, sort of against the church, I would say. And uh, he was on his way. And, uh, and God did something that was very ungentlemanly, very unkind. He zapped him. He took that man, he threw him down into the dirt, blinded him for three days, scales formed over his eyes. I mean, friend, this was not, those of you that say the Holy Ghost is a perfect gentleman, I used to say that, but I've watched him do things in this church. I've watched agnostics come in here, God haters. I'm talking God haters. I've watched them as we get close to them, I've watched them being thrown up against the wall by the power of God. I'm talking about businessmen, athletes, you know, people that are just, they got it all together. And I've watched them being thrown up against the wall and thrown down to the ground and violently jolted by the power of God. And the next thing you know, they're like little puppies down here going, they're going, they're going, what must I do to be saved? So those of you that are here,
those of you that are here and you're like that, you're just an agnostic, you're, you maybe call yourself a God hater, or you don't believe in the Lord, friend, I want to tell you, God's here. He's trying to get a hold of you. I want you to pray this prayer. Everyone pray this prayer with me. Everyone at home, listening in other buildings, I want you to pray this prayer with me. No one is going to be silent right now. Every single person that has vocal cords is going to pray this prayer. It's simple. It's to the point. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I want everyone to turn to their neighbor and say, my, it's early. Good. <laughs> We've had people get up and leave during the break. We've had folks to leave after. We, we'll take a break an hour an hour into the service just to let folks meet one another and we've had folks get up and leave during the break and go dear god this is the most awesome thing i've ever been in and they're walking out the door out there like it's over we're going honey we just got here this is so you can get a drink of water luke chapter six if you turn there in just a few minutes we're going to be praying for you but i want to share from the word of god Luke chapter 6, verse 39. I was going to read a long portion of Scripture here, but I've, I've just decided, and I believe under the guidance of the Lord, to read just one Scripture. Verse 39 of Luke chapter 6. Before I read this Scripture, could you turn your hair, your, your eyes this way and your, your head this way? And listen, listen to me just for a minute. There are folks here. You were here last night, and I preached on woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. And that was a message more of a compassionate heart, a preacher. What makes us tick? Why we do what we do in these services? What keeps us coming night after night after night preaching the gospel? The word woe in the scripture in that one particular passage means it's a calamity. It would be an utter tragedy for me not to preach the gospel. Why? Because he's changed my life. God has changed my life, friends. When he's changed your life, you share it. You share it. That's why this young girl is willing to spend her graduation money on getting her friends to the revival. I've heard hundreds of stories like that. One parent, one, two parents, a mom and a dad bought their kid a car if he would come to the revival. How many would come if somebody bought you a car? Yeah. But people have done anything to get folks to this revival. It is because Jesus Christ is moving. He's changing lives. And that message last night was more of a nice message. It was kind. And uh, every now and then I'll preach messages that I, I would liken them to Twinkies, you know, with, you know, cream filled donuts. They're sweet. They're easy to eat. They're fun. But every once in a while I'll, I'll preach a um, more of a Brussels sprouts type of thing. And this may border more towards Brussels sprouts than Twinkies. Is that all right? And if you get bothered by the preaching, all I can say is good. My job, friend, as an ordained minister of the Assemblies of God, yeah, that's fine, but as an ordained minister of God, my job is to cause everyone to wake up. To wake up. In the church, I'm called as an evangelist to preach to the lost, and I do that all the time, friend. But my job, is to stir this church, stir everyone that comes here. I want you to leave out of here knowing that you know that you know where you stand with God. All right? And there's some religious people that are going to be irritated with me tonight. And I bless you in the name of the Lord. I'm not irritated with you. Why are you irritated with me? Luke chapter 6, verse 39. And he also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into the ditch? The King James reads, Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? I'd like to speak to you for a few minutes on white cane religion. White cane religion. Now, this may come across to some of you as hard, 
This morning, God gave me this message. I get up every morning, get in around 2 or 3 o'clock and get up at 5 every morning to get the message for that evening. And I'm telling you, friend, you talk about a pressure cooker. I'll get before the Lord. I'll say, Jesus, this is not Sunday or next week. This is tonight. I'll get home. I got home this today. Okay, I got home today from the revival last night. And as I laid in bed, I said, Lord, in just a few hours, I'll be getting up. And you will be ready to speak to my heart. And change my life and give me a message. And there's absolutely no pressure. I do not feel a bit of pressure, friend. There's no, prof there's no pressure to perform. There's no pressure to... Uh, to, to dig in theologically and impress people. I have one goal and one goal only, and that's for every five, six, and seven-year-old child to understand this message. And if they'll understand, I know, Grandpa, you will. White cane religion. God's going to speak to some of you tonight about where you stand with God. Listen up. He gave me this little poem, and I'm going to read it. As a matter of fact, you're going to stand up as I read it. I'm going to keep your circulation going, friend. Does this picture belong to anybody here? It's going to go in the fishbowl if you don't come get it. Somebody gave this to me two weeks ago, said to pray over it. I did. You said you'd come get it in three days. You didn't. It's going in the fishbowl. Hey, all right. Here you go. Mission accomplished. Hallelujah. You say it's not true, okay by me, but listen, my friend, and you will see. There is a Pied Piper playing loud and clear. It may be faint, but you draw near. Like a lamb to die, you roam along, unaware of his fateful song. He lullabies, he hums, he sings. To his destiny, your soul he brings. His cadence heard throughout centuries. Get in line, lift up your knees. I'm in charge of this fateful trip. You're in my hands, I've got a grip. A grip on you and your best friend. We're gonna march until the end. Hand in hand, we'll walk this road to the very edge and off we'll go. The load will drop and we will too. Into a pit, your life is through. As you begin to fall headlong, in your heart you'll hear this childhood song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. You remember back to early days when life was simple. You never strayed. You loved the Lord. You held him tight all through the day all through the night but someone came along in life with a bill of goods your soul's the price you're so holy you're so kind come on friend don't be so blind my friends and I are religious too but we'll have fun before life's through we we party we play we feel we feed ourselves on carnal delights don't believe in hell material girl material man trust me friend God understands he doesn't expect you to live so clean come on get real see what I've seen I offered it all to the Lamb of God, fame and fortune everywhere he trod. But he turned me down. What a fool. Now here we are. What about you? Ah, you've loosened your hold on God's sweet hand. Made the choice. Join this hellish band. Like all the rest, your end is clear. You never suspected your fate was near. But it's too late. Go ahead and cry. That's all we hear as people die. They come here thinking all was well. No, not me. I'll never go to hell. Into the ditch we watch them fall as the flames of hell lick up the walls. The truth pounds, pounds loud in the chambers deep. You had your chance, your soul to keep. But I'm not bad as other men. I pay my dues, will till the end. I tithe, I help, sing in the choir. Don't stand there and call me a liar. Of course I'm not on fire like you. It's your job to preach the way you do. I'm just an ordinary child of God. Don't come after me with your chastening rod. Please listen up, my friend, tonight. The Spirit of God says make things right. He is the one who convicts of sin. The Holy Ghost know, knows where you've been. He knows whether you're lukewarm. He also knows why your life is torn. You've sold out to the other side. You've turned from God to follow a blind guide. It's really simple. You've taken the time to listen to this little rhyme. Don't be misled. You must take care or be led down to who knows where. Jesus knows where. He's been there too. He bled and died to salvage you. He snatched the keys of death the grave. 
Only in him your life is saved. So before you leave, walk out these doors. Get right with God. New life in store. He'll open your eyes. The blind will see. Tonight you'll walk in victory. I am extremely concerned for many of you in this room. I have a concern for you in just a few minutes, and I mean just a few minutes, I'm going to give an altar call. And those of you that are away from God, you're going to know without a shadow of a doubt that you are away from the Lord. You're going to know that you know that you know that you're away from God. How many would say to me, I am open to this message. I will listen. Sit down, please. God bless you. Let me begin tonight by saying that everyone within the sound of my voice is religious. Everybody in this room, everyone at home, everyone on the prayer team, everyone in the other buildings, you are religious. I don't care if you're a, an agnostic, if you call yourself an atheist, it makes no difference to me. You are religious. You see, the modern day definition of religious is unlike our forefathers defined it. There was a time when the word religious meant an adherence to Jesus Christ. To say a man was religious was to say he was a fanatical follower of Jesus. But things have changed. Now a religious man can be just about anyone. Religion is a cause, a principle. This is our new definition, by the way, in the 1996 Webster's Dictionary. It is a cause or a principle or system of beliefs held to with zeal and faith. That means a fisherman's religious, a golfer's religious, a computer technician is religious about his work. Everyone here is religious. You can say to me tonight that you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're not a churchgoer, you believe that life as we know it is life as we know it. When it's over, it's over. Your Bible can be a bass fishing guide or an IBM computer manual. I'm telling you, friend, tonight, you're religious. You have latched on to a cause, a belief, and you're willing to go to bat for what you believe in. Everybody with me tonight? Charles Spurgeon, in his day, warned of two extremes, and he said the truth lies between these two extremes. The rationalist who says that man needs no guide whatsoever. Some of you are in this room. Nobody needs a guide. Is he not? Is man not noble? Is he not gifted? Is he not a gifted creature? Can he not reason and judge on his own? He can surely find his own way without direction from without. Why does man need a teacher? He can learn on his own. These type people are self-sufficient, boasters, and will never condescend to sit at the foot of a master or follow the track of a guide. And consequently, and I know many people like this, and consequently, they frequently become erratic, singular, lawless, and unreasonable in their modes of thought and their actions. They often wander into the re religion of atheism. The other extreme group are those who swing to the other side. These are the superstitious. They say, I see I need a guide. I will take the one nearest at hand. The superstitious. Why do you think the psychic channels are skyrocketing right now, friends? Even now, as we're in this sanctuary, there are people blowing well-earned money on 1-900 channels, friend. Calling some no-name and some no-name place who's going to give them some no purpose prophecy over their life and they're going to say something generic you're going to get on the phone and you're going to say my name is Maggie and they're going to say something like you're a girl and people will go dear God they'll say something like you ate yesterday and people marvel without even the slightest consideration of whether or not the guide be a seeing man or blind, 
They yield themselves to these instructors and are often misled. They are weary of thinking for themselves and want others to think for them. This is the religion of so many, and they find superficial peace in it. Spurgeon calls it the peace of slumbering stupidity. I like that. By the way, centuries gone by, everybody dealt with the same thing we're dealing now with, you know? It's all the same, friend. There's nothing new under the sun. I remember talking to my grandma before she died back in the 60s. She told me about the big heroin problem when she was growing up. She said, Steve, you could buy heroin at the drugstore. She said, and many of my friends were heroin addicts. And I thought, Grandma, when you were a kid, there was heroin? You know, if it wasn't heroin, it was alcohol. If it wasn't, there was rebellion. How many understand that? There's always been rebellion. There was rebellion back in the Old Testament. They stoned kids. How many kids would say, thank God I don't live back in the Old Testament? <laughs> Everyone in this room would be dead. There would be no Brownsville revival because there'd be no people. Before going any further, I want to establish a fact. Every one of us needs a guide in life. There's an old adage that the lawyer is saying, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Judge, where are you at, Judge? Is this an old adage? Anyone who represents himself as a, as, let's see, anyone who represents himself as a fool for a client. Is that right? Anyone who represents himself as a fool for a client. Everyone needs a guide. Anyone who attempts to live out his years on earth without guidance, the guidance of God, is a bigger fool than Lucifer. A few points to this message, and then we're going to pray with those of you. Some of you are already bothered. I watch you all the time. I can look at you, and you do this. You bow your head. Gave an altar call the other day up in Springfield, Missouri, and as soon as I said, I mentioned my subject, that I'm about to preach on sin, 100 heads just bowed over. These were pastors. They, it was sudden conviction. Sudden conviction. And it was like the arrows of the Lord pierced their hearts. They knew it was over. It was over. God had their number. Number one tonight, everybody is following somebody. Everybody is following somebody. Remember what Jesus said, a blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a ditch? Everybody is following somebody. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. I can tell by being with you for just a few minutes who you're following. Your actions give you away. Your tongue reveals your system of beliefs by uttering a few simple statements. Some of you are walking, talking sitcoms. You actually find yourself making some of the same blatant statements that were viewed just a few hours earlier on the 18-inch screen. Some of you snap at others, are violent in your behavior, dishonest with your deepest feelings because you've been hanging around others who are the same way. Everybody is following somebody. I'll never forget, friends, in Michigan. I was working in Lansing, Michigan, holding a revival there, and I had a news, there was a newspaper, and on the front of the newspaper, the Lansing Times, there was this picture of a gang member and he was just mean as a snake looking. And I asked the pastor of the church if there's any way we could go visit this gang member on the front page of the paper. He says, as a matter of fact, I think I know where he's at. So early in the morning, I always visit drug addicts and gang members early in the morning because they just got home, all right? And they're there and they're tired, they're beat up, you know, and so that's the best time, friend. Don't get them right when they're fixing to leave. Get them when they're home, you know, they just got home. And so about eight o'clock in the morning, I go over to the house, and knock on his door, knock and knock and knock and knock and knock. And he comes to the door and he's a monster of a man, shaved head, tattoos, you know, earrings up and down both ears and just wild maniac looking man. And uh, I said, hi, my name is Steve Hill. He said, my name is Chris, what do you want? And I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanna come in and talk to you. And he goes, he shuffled, see his gang was gone. It was all gone, friend, it was just me and him, man. And he opened the door and sat down. And I went, I said, I figured since I already got in there, I was gonna go for the gold. I stuck my finger in his fame. I said, I know you, Chris. I know everything about you, man. I said, I wanna tell you, this is what your life is like. 
You go out at night, you got a gang of 35 guys that terrorize Lansing. They all know you. You're the Viceroy gang. You're one of the meanest gangs in this whole area. You terrorize the neighborhoods. You have raped girls, and I know it. You have, you have been involved in thievery. You've been involved in grand uh, theft auto. You're, you're involved in mighty you're, you're fights every night. You go into restaurants and terrorize the restaurants. I know all about you, but let me tell you something, Chris. I also know the man inside of you. I said, when you get home and you shut that door and you go lay in that bedroom right over there, and you're all by yourself. You cry yourself to sleep at night. You ain't no leader. You're just following that bunch of kids around. They poked you up at the top as a leader. But everybody's following somebody. I said, I want to tell you, Chris, you're the most unhappy man on the face of this earth. And you know it. And I came here to tell you that. You know what he did? He didn't buck up to hit me, friend. He started bawling like a baby. You know what he said? He just... You know me, man. You know me. You want to know why I know him? Because this is the truth, friend. Everybody is following somebody. Chris Monroe was just trapped in life, friend. He didn't know where he was going. I want to talk about a few religions tonight. I'm telling you, everybody is following somebody. Say that with me. Everybody is following somebody. I don't believe that, Steve. And I don't believe in God. You're an atheist, friend. You want to know what an atheist is? It's a religion. I don't follow God. I'm not a Baptist. I'm not a Methodist. I'm not a Pentecostal. I'm not a Catholic. I don't believe in all that spirit worship. You, you live your life the best you can when it's all over. Is that you, friends? Some of you are here tonight like that. When it's all over, it's over. You know what you are? You're an, an annihilationist. They've already categorized you, buddy. You're part of a religious group. That's the group that believes after death there is nothing. When you die, it's over. And you thought you were just out there on your own lonesome. No, friend, there's a group that's already got you. You belong to a religion. You're an annihilationist. Perhaps tonight, you're of the Muslim faith. You confess the oneness of God and his prophet Muhammad. You pray five times each day. You give alms to the poor in the local mosque. You fast the daylight hours during the month of Ramadan, and you are planning your once-in-a-lifetime requirement to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. One billion of you live in the world today. I'm going somewhere, friends, so listen carefully. Perhaps tonight you claim allegiance to the nation of Islam. You follow the leadership of Louis Farrakhan. Perhaps you're of the belief that everyone should have freedom to believe the way they choose and that all beliefs should unite and give themselves to social action. You want to know how many Americans that call themselves Christian believe that? Millions of Americans, this is what they believe, that everyone should have the right to choose. Jesus did not give you that right. And Christian, if that's the way you believe, you're anti-Bible. Jesus stuck his finger in their face. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And he said, there is only one way to the Father, and that is through me. Any questions? You believe everyone should believe the way they want to, and that all beliefs should unite and give themselves to social action. Be careful, friend. This is the one world church, and it's moving in quick. And if you believe that, you belong to the Unitarians. That's what they believe. You're no longer one of us. You're no longer a Christian, blood-washed. You are a Unitarian, friend. Go ahead and mark yourself. If that's what you believe, that's what you are. And you're going to be swept right into the one world church at the end. Everybody's following somebody. Hallelujah. I'm going to skip some pages. Because the best part, friend, of this right here, is this question does the somebody you're following know where they're going now I want to illustrate this friend the best way I know how white cane religion
And this, by the way, is not comical. This is serious. Some of you are as blind. Young people, listen to me. Some of you are listening to garbage. Did you know, friend, there are people that talk about this revival and sway people away from the revival that are going to stand on Judgment Day? They're going to stand on Judgment Day for their blindness. The blind leading the blind. There are people that want to get saved at the Brownsville revival. They wanted to get saved tonight, but before they got out of their door, some blind guide got a hold of them and said, you don't need to go over there. God can touch you right here. I'm warning you, friend. I'm going to go ahead and put them on. I'm asking you, friend, who are you listening to? Does the one you're listening to know where they're going? Little girl, are you listening to your boyfriend? Does he even know the Lord? Does he know where he's going? Does he have any inclination what it means to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Who are you listening to? The blind leading the blind. Who's leading you around, friend? Who's telling you what to do and where to go? Who's telling you how close to get to God and how close not to get to God? Who's telling you whether to get on fire or not on fire? Who's leading you down the path of life? I'm warning you, friend. Jesus said, can the blind lead the blind? No, they can't. They'll both fall into the ditch. I'm concerned, friend. I want to tell you what you're fixing to experience. Matter of fact, Michael Brown that was just with us, he's faxing me tonight. He's sending a fax to me of all the quotes of all the people that were anti-Finney, anti-Spurgeon, anti-Whitfield, anti-Wesley, anti-Azusa Street, anti-Wales, anti- There were books written about all those moves of God. People that came out and published newspapers against the move of God. They would watch somebody get healed by the power of God and say, that ain't God. Don't you dare go to California. Don't you dare go to L.A. Don't you dare get involved in that fanatical revival on Azusa Street. God will damn your soul if you go over there. He's got the direct quotes when they came out, friend. He's faxing them all to me tonight. Well, dear God, get them to me quick. Who's guiding you? Who's leading you down the road? I call it white cane religion, friend. That's what I call it. The blind leading the blind in America right now, friend, is wrapped up in this. They don't know where they're going. Look at our nation. Our nation is as lost as lost can be, yet we have a church on every corner. We have a church on every corner, and nobody knows where they're going. Does your psychic have any clue about eternity? Maybe she can tell you what you had for dinner last night, but can she tell you about everlasting damnation tomorrow. Perhaps your guru can meditate you into a sweet moment of peace on earth, but can he lead you to everlasting peace in heaven? I'm asking you tonight, friend, to examine yourself. What an absurd statement for the Lord to make. Can the blind lead the blind? Of course not! But that's exactly what's going on around our nation. You turn on the two. Here are watch. There they are, man. And they'll take somebody. They will take somebody, friend. Our nation is so gullible. Don't be gullible. Don't be a fool. Would you ever take a blind man and put him in the front seat of your car and tell him to drive you home? Would you ever say, blind man, pilot this plane? 
Would you ever say, blind man, sit to the helm of my cabin cruiser and take my family for a trip? Of course you wouldn't, but you put the very same people in front of your life to guide you. The blind, the blind cannot lead the blind friend. They don't know where they're going. They put these folks on front of us, in front of us in our living rooms, just because they broke all the box office records. Just because he's the greatest cowboy, or the greatest space fighter, or the greatest this, or the greatest that, suddenly he's an authority on everything. And they'll put him in front of you, they say, what do you believe about religion? And he says to the masses, I believe that God loves everyone. I believe that if all the young people would begin to take a good look at the hatred in their hearts and rid themselves of any bitterness that may have been placed there through their childhood, through their earlier years, and rid themselves of hate, I believe that they will become united and together we can become a strong nation once again and God will be pleased with us. And millions go, yes! While pastors across the nation are saying, Listen to me, congregation. I am an authority. You do not have to get so wrapped up in your Christian walk that you're out on the streets, that you're out at the marketplace testifying, witnessing, talking about God every hour of the day. God can do that. He can handle that. He's got angels. You do not have to do that. And something else, congregation, you do not have to be so vocal in your worship you do not have to be such emotional creatures when it comes to expressing your love to God I know I'm your pastor the person that you're following know where he's going. Dear God, I plead for these people. Open their eyes. God, don't let us fall. I heard for you, friend. I don't know why, because some of you are so wrapped up into people. You could have damned your soul to hell because of somebody. Somebody. Listen to me, friend. That somebody is going to stand alone before God. You won't be with that somebody. Some of you are debating whether or not to get saved tonight, get on fire for God, because there's another partner in your marriage or another person in your, in your life that you wonder how they think. What about what God thinks? Who cares what they think? On that final day, you will stand before God Almighty alone. And we listen to these people like they're authorities, friend. Only God opens blinded eyes. Where are they leading you, friend? Boy, I feel this tonight. Boy, I, let me talk just for a minute about the authorities on revival that are out there. Whoo. Boy, I want to tell you, I could preach all night on these authorities. There's fixing, a book's fixing to come out. I'm just warning you ahead of time. I get, the, I get a lot of stuff about six months before it happens because I'm in touch with a lot of publishers. There's a book coming out pretty soon on counterfeit revival that's going to blast everything that's taking place across the world. I grieve for that man. I grieve. I grieve for the publishers. I don't know why. That's what they're doing. And behind them, they have a couple million critical people that are saying, Fine. I'm so glad you spoke up, brother, because I sure didn't want to get in that. I didn't want to get involved in that. I was getting so sucked up into it, but thank you, now I got a book. Thank you for this Bible that you've given me to go along with my King James and my New America. Now I can read about your revival, and it's obvious it's never coming. 
Who are you listening to? Let me warn you something, pastors. You surround yourself with the same kind of people as you are, like critical folks. If you're a critical man, you surround yourself with critical people. This is you. That's you. And all of you together will fall headlong into the ditch. Why? You sit together, you have your little meetings, and everyone's criticized. Everyone criticizes the same thing. So you meet for about an hour, you rip to shreds. You, it's called spiritual mayhem. Read up, read the word, read, look up the word mayhem in the, in the book, and you'll see mayhem means a destruction, a mutilation. It's called mayhem of the body of Christ. That's what you've done. You've mutilated the body of Christ for an hour, ripped up this pastor, ripped up this evangelist, tore him to shreds. The whole time, all of you just sitting there, just tapping your canes on the table. What do you got to say about that, brother? Well, I'm glad you asked. Where's my cane? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. Let me, let me point on the blackboard all about this man. You no more know what you're talking about, friend. Blind leading the blind. Why don't you invite someone into that circle that's on fire? Why, why don't you invite somebody in that would irritate all of you? Cross the grain. Someone who will come into your little circle and go, maybe sit there and go, hmm, hmm, hmm. I want to tell you why this revival is sweeping this nation because people are sick of the criticism. They're, they are so sick of it, Pastor. So the best thing for you to do is just drop that, that get off that boat quick because it's sinking. People are sick of it, man. They're sick of Matter of fact, when people come up to me to criticize, it's, to me it's just like they just pour in bad, a bad taste in the air. Just, it's just pollution. You know, I've been around the clean air of heaven, man. I don't want that junk. Don't talk to me about that. Don't, don't spew that out. Tell me you love everybody, please. You know? Phew. So early. I'm going to close, I promise. But I left my notes, Pastor. Let's see. Doing fine. Does the person you're following know where they're going? I know one thing, friend. I could give an altar call right now. I got one more point. Because some of you men are so convicted. Let me tell you, those of you that have been around council like this, you're all right. You're okay. You're just going through a hard time. Now, you know what it's called? It's called sin. And you are a sinner. <laughs> and, friend, when, I, when you realize that, it is healing to your bones. It's like, whoa, the diagnosis. Finally, what, that's, <laughs> you finally said something concrete. This is sin. I'm a sinner. And then we can give the prescription. But if someone comes up and gives you some vague analysis of what you're going through, like you're just passing through a phase. Well, my son's been passing through this phase for eight years. He'll come out of it. Yeah, but he's robbing people at gunpoint. Yeah, but he'll pass. It'll pass. Friend, we hear that, love your son. Don't spank your boy. Don't spank your boy. I know all about this. Don't spank your boy. And now we're dealing with the Dr. Spock unspank generation. guiding you white cane religion I want no part of it charity act like you're getting ready to come up here <laughs> just shuffle in your seat a little bit and look like going ah, 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 ah. <laughs> she's going to sing run to the mercy seat I love one of the stories, and I am going to close in just a second, friends, but one of the stories in the Bible, 
You may have never seen it like this, but I see it like this. It was uh, John chapter 3. Remember old Nicodemus? Remember at him at night? He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was an old dog is what he was. But God was going to teach an old dog new tricks. And, and Nicodemus was sitting in his bench one day. It grew dark. He had already been talking all day long with the blind guides, you know. All his friends had been sitting around in the circle and discussing things. And he got up, put on his shades, pulled out his white cane and went, Anybody seen Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, he's over there. Where? Over there. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus? Yes, sir. Jesus. Is that you? Jesus of Nazareth. You know me, don't you? I'm Nicodemus. I'm... You know all this, don't you, Jesus? Lord, we've been talking, and we know you're sent from God because nobody can do the things that you do unless they're sent from God. Jesus, would you help me? Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? what he said, friends. That's what he said. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? I know all this religion is garbage. We don't know what we're talking about. No one does the signs and wonders like you do, Lamb of God. Who am I? Who are we? Why are we here? Jesus said, you must be born again, didn't you? You must be born again. I love that story, friend. It's an example of what could happen to a blind man. God touched him that day, I guarantee you. My last point tonight, boy, you've been a good group. I appreciate you so much for listening. But Jesus Christ, wants to open your eyes and guide you down the path of life. Number one, everybody's following somebody. Number two is the person you're following. You're following them. Do they know where they're going? My answer to most of you is no. They don't know where they're going, friend. Why are you listening to them, man? I want to tell you something else, friend. Some of you, you're going to take this old white cane this whole front of this church is going to be littered with them tonight. You're going to leave this old cane behind. The scales are going to fall from your eyes tonight. You're going to walk out of this place. You're going to walk out brand spanking new, friend. You're going to walk up to those old blind guys, and you're going to go, ho, 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 you need to go to Brownsville. You're not going to believe what happened to me. Yes, Lord. You're not going to believe what happened to me. They're going to go, wait just a cotton picking minute. What are you talking about? I'm the guy around here. I've been born again. We had some people saved last night that are irritating their parents, by the way. See, God is saving smart people in this revival. And that bugs parents that don't know God when they're intelligent sons and daughters, you know, that they want their son and daughter to go off and, you know, be great in the intellectual, educational system, and their son comes down here, or their daughter comes down here, falls to the ground under the power of God, moans and groans on the ground. I mean, friend, it irritates mom and dad. And last night, man, some folks left this revival, and they went home to Mama. Mama was standing there with her cane. And what happened to you tonight, son? Where are you anyway? <laughs> I'm over here, Mama. <laughs> I'm over here, Mama. 
Mama, I want to tell you what happened to me last night. Oh, dear God, what happened, son? I went to Brownsville. I don't want to hear anymore. They talked about sin, Mama. They told me I was a sinner. And you know, I've never told you this, Mama, because I've been scared, but I've always felt funny inside, like that something was wrong. And when the preacher started talking about sin, my heart started pounding. And I knew something was cooking, Mama. I didn't know what it was. But the preacher said, if I just come down to the altar, Mama, if I just come down to the altar and ask Jesus to wash my sins away, then I'd be forgiven. And that feeling would go away. Mama, I went down to that altar and I couldn't have been down there 30 seconds when something came over me, Mama! Oh! Something came over me! I'll never be the same! I'll never be the same! Oh! Mama! I'm happy. I'm free. Now, son, me and your father want to explain something to you. First of all, we don't go for all that stuff. That was a Pentecostal church, wasn't it, boy? Let me tell you about, where'd you go? Let me tell you about those Pentecostals. They don't know no more about God than the man on the moon. You need to stay with mom and dad. We'll instruct you. We'll teach you. We'll show you, son. We've educated you. You're 21 years old. You'll make it in life, son. Don't get religion. We can guide you. Follow us, son. What are you standing there for? Follow us. Sorry, mama. <laughs> I've got Jesus in my heart, man. My eyes are open! My eyes are open! My eyes are open! No! Don't want none of that white cane religion! I don't want it, friend. The blind can lead the blind straight to hell. I'm on my way to heaven with those that have had their eyes open. They're open. They're open. They're open. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus wants to open your eyes tonight, friend. This ain't religion. Religion's hanging around the cross. Christianity's getting on the cross. This is not religion. Don't anyone with your chairs move yet. I'm going to talk to you just for a minute, then you're going to move the chairs here. We're going to need this whole altar space tonight. I want to tell you what's going on, friend. Many of you are so, so hungry. You are so hungry for truth. You're so hungry for truth. You're sick of groping. And that's what blind people do. And if you've got a blind member in your family, I love him dearly. One of my best friends, Baba Yala, he's blind. He's sung here at the revival. He's coming back, by the way, to sing at the revival. We love him dearly. But Bob would stand up here and he'd be amen in me all the way through this thing. He's blind as a bat, man. He loves God with all his heart, soul, and strength. He'd be going, preach it, brother, preach it. You would never put me driving your car, Steve. It's funny, friend, but I want to tell you, some of you got the wrong person driving your car. They're saying, we're turning here, we're turning there, we're doing this, we're doing that. When are you going to stand up and go, no, we're not. No, we're not. You don't, you don't seem to understand. I'm getting saved tonight. <laughs> I'm getting saved tonight. When are you going to stand up, friend? When are you going to stand up? When I got saved, 
Hundreds of my blind friends went tapping down the highway. I went dancing down the other way. You know? They're just, and they were saying things like, you fool. You know? Think of it, friend. You idiot. What do you want to see? <laughs> that's, how, that's how it looks, isn't it, friend? That's how it looks when you really get saved. It looks so dumb. That's why we beg with people. We plead with them at the grocery stores, at the marketplace. I look at them, and it's like they're trying to convince me how much fun they're having. And it's just like so dumb. Stupidity. Man, wouldn't you like to have your eyes open? Wouldn't you like to see the way it really is? Some of you are so wrapped up in your problems. You're so wrapped up in the life you're living right now, friend. God is going to open up your eyes right now. You're going to see, see, your problem's not your work. Your problem's not your relationships with people. Your problem's not your econo economy. It's not your bank account. Your problem is not because you're less educated or more educated than someone else. Your problem is not because you're not as smart as this person or, or you know, th those aren't your problems. Your problem is you're not close to Jesus. If you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. Those of you that feel like you're uneducated, some of the greatest preachers that ever graced this continent couldn't even speak the English language. I mean, they massacred it. They would stand behind the pulpit and shake tens of thousands of people. D.L. Moody was one of them. Shake the multitudes. Why? Just a common man with an uncommon God. <laughs> Powerful man. When he spoke, people listened because they knew he had his eyes open. The rest of them were like scribes and Pharisees. Charity's going to sing a song called Run to the Mercy Seat. A bunch of you are going to turn in your canes tonight. You're going to drop your glasses at the altar. You're going to leave out here with your eyes wide open. Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to share, i got a couple pages on that, but he has, he has the power to open your eyes tonight. Only Jesus can, friend. Drop the other junk, would you? See, Jesus, you can't accept Jesus tonight like a hip pocket, get out of jail free card, you know, just another part of your life. He becomes your life. That's why some of you have blown it. That's why some of you have blown it, because Jesus, you asked him to come be part of your life. No, he wants your whole life. He wants everything, friend. He wants to heal your blindness. He wants to open your eyes, friend. He wants to change everything for you. He's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. He's not something you hang from your dashboard mirror. Charity's going to sing Run to the Mercy Seat. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give an altar call for everyone in this place that needs Jesus Christ to come into their life. You're tired of the blindness. You're tired of being led astray. You want Jesus Christ to heal your spiritual eyes. You want the Lord to come and be the Lord and master of your life, your guide. I don't care about tomorrow, friend. He's got my hand. It doesn't make any difference to me. Jesus is already there. He is already there tomorrow. And I'm going to step into it. He's already been there. He knows everything that's going to go on. He's my guide. He wants to be that for you, friend. Those of you that are away from God tonight, you need forgiveness. Those of you tonight that have never known the Lord, but you know exactly what I'm talking about, friend. You're as blind as blind can be. But you want to meet Jesus. You want to meet the one, the one who John the Baptist looked up at and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You want to meet the one that opens up the blinded eyes, friend. The one who set 25,000 blind men free in this revival. 25,000 have come left their canes down here at this altar, friend. Religious people, those of you that are religious in this room, listen to me. Religion will damn you to hell. Religion will not save you. Don't tell me how much you know about the Lord. Tell me, do you know the Lord? Do you know him? Everybody knows about him. That's why I never argue with anybody about anything. I will not ever argue. I talk to people, I say, do you know Jesus? They'll go, well, let me tell you what my church believes. 
Back off, Jack. I asked you a question. Do you know Jesus? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you sing his praises through the day? Is he your love? Is he everything to you? Do you worship him? Do you know him? Is he everything to you? Well, Steve, what our church believes is if you're baptized as an infant and confirmed when you're 12 years old, then you're going to go, I didn't ask you that, friend. What are you going to do? Stand before God one day and go, <clears throat> God, you know what denomination I'm from, and you know what we believe. Case closed. He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. Next. Do you know him? Young people, do you know him? When Charity begins singing this song, you're going to come to the altar as quickly as you can. You're going to come to this altar. Those of you that need forgiveness in this place, there's a blockage between you and the Lord, and you know it. Something has severed you from God. It can be pornography. It can be witchcraft. It can be the, the love of money, which is the root of all evil. It's damning this county. It's damning the panhandle of Florida, the love of money. I watch it. I can smell it, and I can see it in the eyes of the people. More, more, more. I don't care about my family. I said more, more, more. I want a bigger house, a bigger car, a bigger this, a bigger that. If that's a sin that's gotten between you and God, you need to repent, sir, as much as a drug addict needs to repent. You need to come back to God tonight. Those of you that are backsliders, you're away from the Lord, this is your opportunity to come to Jesus. Come back to Jesus. Come back. Come back. Some of you, I just saw this in the spirit realm. Some of you, your eyes are glazed over. You can still see. You're not totally blind. You can still see a little bit. You're in a backslidden condition. But you can tell the further you get away from God, the darker it's getting. And your eyes are getting almost completely closed. Somebody brought you to this revival tonight. And you're seeing for the first time in a long time. Your scales are beginning to come off. I want to tell you, I'm warning you, friend. If you don't come down to this altar, when you walk out those doors, those scales are going to crust over your eyes. God's trying to help you. You come to this altar as soon as charity sings. Here's what we're going to do. Down, uh, everyone... Everyone in the congregation, I want you to stand. Nobody talking and nobody moving around. Nobody move right now. This is a solemn moment. Everyone that is in a chair at the front, we need your room. So this is what you're going to do. I know Bill Bush already talked to some of you, but I've already talked to Bill, and this is how we're going to handle it tonight. You're going to pick up your chair. Okay, you're going to go off to the side. Your chair is going to go that way. Okay, there's going to be ushers standing off in that area to help you with the chairs. Your chairs are going by, behind these trees. They're going to take the chairs off. Once the chair is back there, you're going to line up. And do not leave, friend, but line up around the edge of this sanctuary and just stand there. Does everyone understand that? Okay, from this point over, take your chair that way. This point over, take your chair that way. Leave your chair with the ushers and then line up through here. Charity is going to sing, run to the mercy seat. Look at me, everybody. This is your opportunity to get right with the Lord. Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. He's been trying to get a hold of you. You're going to drop the white cane of religion tonight. Everybody believes in something. Everybody follows somebody, friend. But tonight I want to ask you, who are you following? Who are you listening to? And you know without a shadow of a doubt you need to follow Jesus Christ. You know it. We've had New Agers saved in here by the scores. New Agers. Why? They know that's all hogwash, man. It's hogwash. It's junk. Mystics come to this revival, get saved. Witches have come and gotten saved. Why? They know. It's no match to the power of God. None of it is a match to the power of the Lord. And their eyes are wide open when they come into this place. We've had intellectuals come in here. We've had brilliant people. We've had successful businessmen and women come in this place, and suddenly the Lord grips them, and they realize that all their intelligence is not getting them ten feet in life. They need the Lord, and they need Him now. Charity's going to sing, run to the mercy seat. Everyone in this room, you need God to forgive you. Those of you putting up your chairs, when this altar call is given, every one of you that need Jesus, you're going to come also. 
You're going to come to the cross tonight. You're going to come and the Lord's going to open up your blinded eyes. As soon as she begins to sing, everyone who needs forgiveness in this room, you need the Lord to wash your sins away. You need to come back to Jesus. You need forgiveness. Every single one in this room, in the balcony, at home, as soon as she sings, I want you to come quickly and let the Lord wash those scales from your eyes I want you to come right now I need the Lord I need the Lord come on right now friend I need forgiveness I need forgiveness come right now come on right now I need the Lord hurry 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 come on come on come on come on come on come on I need the Lord come on I face the power groping around and someone's trying to help you see and you don't stand there get down here to this altar God I'm gonna come get you man God's dealing with your heart what are you doing standing in your seat you know you're supposed to be down here get down here right now the Lord is dealing with your heart he's speaking to you about your Christianity some of you are so far from God it's sickening if you should die tonight you know you would go to hell if the Lord would appear here and walk close to you, would he embrace you or would he look at you and say, who are you? Who are you? But Lord, Lord, don't call me Lord, Lord. We don't know each other. Never have. But Jesus, it's me. You, you talk to me over grace at the table. That's all I ever hear from you. Thank you for this food. Amen. We don't know each other. Get down here right now. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I can feel this, friend. I can feel this. I can feel this. Come on right now. I need Jesus. You need forgiveness. Come on, friend. Come on down to this altar. You need the Lord. You need the Lord. Come on. Come on. Come on right now. Come on right now. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Listen to your heart, friend. Listen to that. You hear that? That's a Holy Ghost. That's called conviction. It's mighty. I just can't wait to get out of this service, Steve. This is spooky. It'll be spooky outside, too, friend. You might as well get saved. Come on. Come on. Come on. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Everybody look this way. I know what the problem is. God just showed me. Some of you are standing there. This is what you look like. Lord, just reveal this to me. We're going to help you. We really are. We're here to help you. We love you. I want to see you saved. You're standing there just like this. You're standing. I saw you just sin. You're standing there with your cane. You're blind right there. You're standing right where you're at. You want to know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get you a C&I dog to bring you down to this altar. I'm going to help you, man. He's not going to look like a dog. He'll look like a human. But there's going to be a person that turns to you right now, and they're going to say this to you. Do you need forgiveness? Look at me, friends. 
Don't stand there like that, looking straight at him, because, you know, it's pretty obvious when you're blind. Don't look at him like this and go, no, I'm fine. Why would you think I needed forgiveness? Why do you think I'm blind? Don't stand there like that, friend. Look at him and say, I do, I need forgiveness. I need forgiveness. See, there's a warfare going on right now in this building. And I'm a man of war. I'm a violent man. I am a violent man, friend. I'm not going to give up on you. You need to thank God somebody's not going to give up on you. So this is what we're going to do. And no one's going to lie in this room. We're going to turn to one another in this place up in the balcony and down here. Some of you are still coming. You're, you're going to turn to one another in this place. Look at me, friend. Quit being so distracted. You're going to turn to one another and you're going to say to the person next to you, do you need forgiveness? Do you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away? Do you need forgiveness? And when someone does that to you, you're not going to lie to them. You're going to turn, you're going to look straight at them and you're going to go, yeah, I do. You're going to be honest. Those of you that need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away, you're going to be honest. This ain't the mall. This ain't the food court where you lie to people. You know, people ask you how you're doing and you say, fine. And you, fine. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Bye. Bye. And you walk away. Your family's falling apart. Your husband's leaving you. Your kids are on drugs. And everything's fine. This is church. Don't lie. If you need Jesus Christ to wash those sins away, friend, and you know you're away from the Lord right now, you look at that person and say, yes, I need forgiveness. And right now, hundreds are about to come. We're going to help you. Some nights, hundreds come at the very first wave. Other nights, the devil sits on their lap. Every one of you, turn to the person next to you, ask them if they need forgiveness, and then both of you come down as quick as you can. Everyone do it right now. Come on, both of you, come down. Come on, right now. Come on, both of you, let's go. Now, come on, right now. Let's go, let's go. Come on, come on. Both of you, come down right now. In the balcony, let's go. In the balcony, let's go. Hurry, 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 hurry. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. In the balcony, let's go. Let's go. Hallelujah. That was good, but several folks didn't understand. Look at me in the balcony. You can't tell me that hundreds of people up in the balcony that everybody's fine and dandy. You can't tell me that. We've been in this revival too long, friends. I want everyone to do it again. You turn to the person next to you, ask them if they need forgiveness, and then both of you come down here together. Do it again right now. Do it again right now. Both of you come down here. Both of you come down here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hurry. Hurry. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Yes, God bless you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't lie to God. Don't lie to man. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Workers, have you joined us? All the workers here? Come on, folks. Come on down. I'm not going to keep this altar call open. If you're going to come, get down here right now, friend. There is, I want to tell you what's in this place. There is a hellish bondage on many of you folks. We're trying, all right? But if you go to hell, it's because you wanted it with all your heart, soul, and strength. You wanted it, you got it. If you walk out of here blind, it's because you wanted your blindness. Come on. Come on. Come on. Young people, do you know the Lord? Mom, Dad, do you know the Lord? Come on. 
There's some true repentance going on here tonight. God bless you, man. Don't wait anymore, friend. What's going on? Those of you in the other parts of the building, you come right now. You come right now. Let's pray. Everyone at the altar, we're going to pray. Those of you that failed to come at this altar call, you need to learn about the patience of God. I want to tell you one thing, friend. A loving Savior will one day be a severe judge. And those of you that think that everything's just going to be fine and dandy in the by and by and God's going to put up with all this junk in your life, wrong, friend. Are they still coming? Is anybody still coming from over here? Anybody else? You know you're supposed to be down here. We're going to pray. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. There's a, there's a woman. You're in your mid-30s. You know you're not right with God, and your heart's doing this right now. I'm going to tap it off with this cane, friend. you got 60 seconds. Starting now. Fifty seconds. God bless you. Forty seconds. Twenty. Come on. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. I want everyone at the altar to pray with me right now. Bow your heads, close your eyes, and we're going to pray and ask Jesus Christ to wash our sins away tonight. Pray with me, everyone at the altar. Dear Jesus, everyone out loud, once again, dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. Thank you for not leaving me alone. I need you. I need you tonight. Open my eyes that I might see I don't want to be blind anymore. I want to see. I want to see clearly. Lord Jesus, I have sinned. I've broken your heart. I've hurt you, and I've hurt others. Forgive me. Wash me clean. Wash my sins away. Cleanse my heart. I ask you to be my Lord my Savior, and my very best friend. From this moment on, I will follow you all the days of my life. You are my guide. No more white cane religion. I will follow you all the days of my life. In your precious name, amen. Hallelujah.